Welcome, my friends. You have once again stumbled into the nexus of grocery stores, retail media, and fun land. That's right, you've arrived in the garage. I'm your host, Dan Massimino, and I'm very excited today to bring you a different kind of garage episode. We're turning introspective. After all, one should always know thyself. Now, just hold on, dear Alice. We don't want to fall too far down the rabbit hole just yet. Let me just take a quick minute to thank our many listeners out there in podcast land. Your support is humbling, instructive, and oh so needed. So podcast crowd, thank you for tuning in and giving us your ears for a bit while we try to make the retail media industry a better place for us all. If you do happen to be joining us for the first time, come on in, grab your tool belt and find a place at our workbench and let me fill you in on what we do with our time together. The Garage is a place where we get together and talk about many things, but where we really hit the sweet spot is when we get some friends and dive into the why, the how, and the who cares about retail media innovation. Now, as I said, we're turning the tables on ourselves today and giving the guest a bit of a rest. It's time to look in a mirror and justify what it is we say we do here. Today's special program is one where my co-host and I will look back at some of the themes we've teased out during our many episodes. We will explore our backgrounds, talk a little bit about where we came from and found ourselves here in the retail media industry. We're going to talk about some of the great guests that we've had. And lastly, we'll discuss just how and why the garage came to be. Sound good? All right. Then without further ado, I introduce you to the man whose workbench is always clean, has a tape measure and pencil handy and sharp at all times, and never, never does a job without thinking safety first. The Vice President of Product Innovation at Albertsons Media Collective, Evan Havorka. What's going on, my man? Good afternoon, Dan. Thanks for that intro. What's going on? Well, excited to rehash our podcast learnings and purpose, but really excited to get into this episode to explore some of your history. You've done such a fantastic job hyping up and articulating what all of our guests have been doing, what they're up to, what they're good at, including some unsolicited and unpaid for compliments to all my intros. So today we're going to turn the tables a little bit and learn a little bit more about what Dan is all about. And I think you're right, rehash what the garage purpose is, and then maybe some teasers on what's coming. But super excited to just be with you today in the shop and curious to see what we're going to build today. It's always fun when you get to speak about yourself. It's challenging. It's humbling, but I'm happy to answer any questions, just don't make it an interrogation, yeah? <laughs> no, no, we'll, we'll treat ourselves with a little more kid gloves than our guests. Oh, good, 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 good. We've had a pretty remarkable run here, as it were, in the garage. And I think that for our listeners who have tuned in in the past, but maybe some of the ones that are just kicking it on for the first time, I think it's important if we reset a little bit. And if you would be willing, can you tell us a little bit about where the heck the garage came from and why do we call it the garage? a little bit of the genesis of this inspirational podcast that we have here. The garage started really as a concept growing up in rural Saskatchewan, really remote. So this town I grew up in of 13 people, hours away from the nearest city. 13 people. Let's not gloss over that. That's current population. I think it could have been a whopping 27, 28 when I was growing up there. Records are tough to come by. But that small town, Growing up, riding motorbikes, riding horses, things would break and you would need to fix them yourself or wait for a week and a half to go to the city. And so very motivated as a youth growing up in the prairies of Canada to fix that motorbike or fix that car. And so necessity being the mother of invention, that forced me to learn how to do certain things with a humble approach. Didn't have the skills necessarily, didn't have always the right parts. Sometimes you'd go to the part shed or the old junk pile and pull some things off of old vehicles and try to make it work. But really, it was a persistent, curious approach to solving those problems. And then as life went on, moved into a house, was able to secure a garage, quickly turned that into a similar type of space and used it as a place to host friends. So today, the garage currently physically exists, and it is a third stall in my house here in Minnesota. And in there, hosted whiskey parties, innovation sessions, a lot of the partners that we've had on this podcast have come in, and I've got half of it set up with whiteboards, projectors, posted notes, the whole kind of innovation session vibe lives there. But it's more than that. It's very inviting. It's very much a collaboration. So there's no pay grades considered in that space. It's all very much an egoless, collaborative, innovative space where people can speak up, speak their mind. There's no dumb questions. 
And the whole intent is to solve a problem or invent something new, figure out how to partner with the collective intelligence of everyone in that room. So there's no space to be quiet. Um, You're there for a, a reason, and the reason is to contribute. And so everyone gets to have a voice and co-design, co-build, co-solve, whatever the problem is. And then usually there's some fun tied to it too. So I got a lot of novelties, cool old parts, motors, motorcycles, things that can kind of inspire, cross-pollinate. A lot of the greatest inventors were dual disciplined. And so seeing some of those other distractions and ideas can help spur new ideas in our very much digital software-based world. So that's the backstory. We've turned that into a bit of a marketing angle within our collective because we want to bring that same inventive spirit on the road. So the Garage Podcast was a manifestation of that. And then we've also done these ideation sessions all over the globe where we'll invite our partners or potential partners to come sit with us in a space called the garage. And we've tried to recreate that as best as possible where it's pen and paper. We're not looking for a sales pitch. We know off-the-shelf software doesn't work for a lot of new industries, retail media included. And so let's design something that can actually work for both of us. That's the 10-minute regurgitation, Dan. I hope that landed well. No, I think it's a really cool story because it's not one that you hear a lot. As you have traveled the globe, as you said, when you've been a part of many different industries, grocery, retail media, others will explore when we start talking about your background a little bit. Have you heard of other partners or other areas, other industries having something similar to this? There's the old narrative of the West Coast Garage for some of the early software development and computer development companies. HP comes to mind, but I think Apple and maybe Microsoft had some early starts in a garage. But in terms of modern software dev and computer dev, I haven't. And I think it's a kudos to our marketing and events teams, which Dan is a part of, to challenge the status quo. I always hate those meetings where the deck has been curated to such a degree where every word is typed or the sales pitch PDF is canned and you you could really do the same thing on your own reading a website. And we have all these really brilliant minds coming to meet us at CES or Brand Week or Can. And then we're going through these pre-canned concepts and it pains me to sit through that type of meeting. So thanks to the strong belief by Christy, our leader, we were able to shift some of those meetings into a whiteboard session. So bring in some of those garage elements with the post-it notes. And I think most people have been involved in some sort of ideation session like that. But to purposely have a meeting around that, we know whatever you're pitching, whatever we're currently using isn't going to be a perfect match. Let's admit that, roll up our sleeves, and right off the bat, co-design and co-build from scratch. It really forces the folks who know the most and want to contribute the most to the top. And we can then work directly with that head architect or the head CRO, CMO, CIO of a company and get to the answers we need without having to go through some of the sales calls that we sometimes sit through. So I'm rambling now. No, you're good. I appreciate that because as a former teacher and thinking about how do I get my best out of my students, and I know we'll talk a little bit about education here in a bit, getting the best out of my students, I would get it when it was learned by doing. And so bringing those folks Who's the most intelligent person in the room? The room is. So you've got these brilliant minds that are coming together into this room and thinking or dreaming big. What needs to be true? What could it look like? What if? I mean, and then whiteboarding it out and coming up with a brand new concept or idea. And then for goodness sake, let's just go test it. And I got to be honest, I got through high school on the guest check and refine method. I don't know why it wouldn't work in retail media. So I really believe in the process and believe in the ideation sessions that we've hosted and I've seen and been a part of. It's really inspiring to see that in action and not just talked about. Well, let's shift into that, Dan, because I think some of the most powerful moments in the garage have come from that whiteboard. Person X, go up to the whiteboard, please, and describe how your architecture works for this clean room. And then they're drawing it. Maybe there's another expert from their company in the room and they're doing some self-correcting. Like you're really putting everything out there. It can feel dangerous if it's not a safe place because you got to let all of your knowledge shine in a kind of document that everyone in the room can look at. And so the whiteboard session, for me, turns into a visual, and then it persists ideas over time, right? And it's malleable, so you can have idea one, idea two, idea three. So as a visual learner, that hits for me. But I know you've got education and a background across all learning types. I'd just love to hear you talk about that, not even necessarily tied to the garage concept yet, but I'd love maybe to wrap it up with 
tying it back to the garage. But let's hear a little bit about your background in education. Oh, it's a meandering tale, much like many a stream up in rural Saskatchewan, I'm sure. So my tale begins probably before even being a teacher. And how the heck did I eventually come to the retail or the grocery sector? I grew up the son of a legendary grocer, Mike Massimino. He was with Albertsons for 45 plus years. A lot of us came from what we call that old coaching tree and to this day is one of the smartest men in the room, regardless of content or topic. He's brilliant when it comes to grocery. I was fortunate enough the other day to sit with him and an old friend of his who still works in the CPG industry and they were picking his brain and it was a, I don't know what's above PhD, but a PhD level conversation around how do you do the right thing for the customer, but the right thing for the company at the same time. I mean, you got guys that there's probably a combined 200 plus years of experience and they were taking notes as if it was a first year college class as he was speaking. So a lot of the retail background and the information I learned by truly being in the growing up in the back rooms of Albertsons, walking around and playing in the dairy cases and using feather dusters to dust the cans. So that's how I grew up. But ultimately, it I became a fifth grade teacher and really liked to infuse as much technology into my classroom as possible, had a firm belief in I'm not the sage on the stage. I know hard to believe for some people listening to this podcast. I wanted to be the guide on the side. If I had one of these, and if you're watching a video, I'm holding up a cell phone. This houses every piece of human knowledge ever created or will be created. Great. So as a teacher, my thought was, now what can I do with that? So I was never afraid of technology. I always wanted to bring as much as I can into my classroom. That led to me being asked by my alma mater, Go Broncos, Boise State University, uh, a colleague of mine asking me to step out of the classroom to see if we could work on a project that was nationwide and it was really trying to bring our classrooms into the 21st century. By the way, we're 24% of the way in. Where's your classroom at? This was pre-COVID. And so it was some of the ideas that we had about like, could we do some stuff via distance learning? That was revolutionary. And that's not how we've always done it, trying to disrupt that mentality, particularly across the state of Idaho, but then really spanning those bright spots across the rest of the country. That led to me working in the Center for School Improvement and Policy Studies at Boise State. Started doing some self-taught marketing on the great story that was not being told in the College of Education at Boise State. So working on some of those projects in bringing that story to life. And frankly, that led to, I'm not joking here, one parking lot over was Albertson's Corporate. And I was just starting to explore what I wanted to be when I grew up. I was either go be a superintendent or continue work at Boise State or maybe try something new. And there was this job called shopper marketing. I mean, I had the word marketing in it, not quite sure what everything else was, but I decided to throw my hat in the ring and apply. A great mentor of mine, Karen Sales, Saw my application, interviewed me. I must have said the right stuff. And voila, I shifted parking lots and became a manager within shopper marketing at Albertsons Companies. Worked on that for a while, long time actually. Ran that for a bit. And we launched this retail media network. And an Evan Havorka and a Christy Argelon came on board. And my now mentor, Elizabeth Perryman, said, Hey, why don't you come over and learn some actual marketing here, not just shopper marketing, but marketing marketing to help us tell the story because no one tells a story better and and we need a lot of education out there. And I know your rich background in education. So I jumped over and have slowly worked my way into owning the learning and development for Albertsons Media Collective, where I'm the director of growth marketing, we call it. Learning and development is part of that. Demand generation is part of that. Sales enablement is part of that. And merchandise enhancement, I guess we'll call it, is part of that. So that's where I'm at. Now, I say all that to say why a podcast? Because even before this meandering path started, I was in construction and my construction company had a radio show that was statewide here in Idaho. And I got the opportunity to host that a few times. So I had a little bit of radio production and that led to, hey, is there anybody that can post this thing? And I raised my hand or was voluntold, I should say, by Elizabeth. And here we are, Evan. That was called rambling for the record. There's the definition. Wow. Nice. That was concise. And I'm glad you landed on that radio comment because it just gives me a little more confidence when my voice doesn't sound quite so. The dulcet tones just don't resonate quite as nicely as yours. Ha, I don't know about dulcet tones. <laughs> <laughs> but we make a nice duo, not to our own anymore because we can move on to other topics. But as the builder of new things and innovative 
products for the collective, my team struggles with a couple things. What is possible? We're not, in general, even our core products typically don't do well with off-the-shelf software. Not to say Albertsons is the most complicated or most advanced company in the world. We have some very cool capabilities, but we're just new, unique. We have a multi-division, multi-banner type of company. So a lot of the software just isn't designed to the complexities that we bring. And what I would say, Evan, though, is just to chime in on that, Albertsons is a complex beast. You're right. We have many, many divisions. We have many, many banners. So it's not just a challenge for retail media. It's a challenge, I mean, period. But we believe very strongly in the local authority and the greatness of our local stores and our local divisions because they know the customer. They're closest to the customer. So... While it is a challenge, we like to overcome the challenges, but we believe in it. Soup to nuts on how our business model operates. Oh yeah, great point. Challenge from a point of view of buying a single software that works for all of those banners and divisions and retail media channels. It's done that way because that's what's best for shopper, best for customer. So that is not going to move because that is why we exist. So then it's my job to move and help partners move with us to build custom software, build custom contracts. And I'm not saying software from scratch, but it's usually a couple pieces of existing software, maybe written under a different contract or partnered with another company who can come in and compensate. Point being, the innovation that we build generally doesn't exist before, hasn't existed before. And so to expect a sales team or to expect a measurement team to have off-the-shelf solutions for it or knowledge on how to sell it, that just is a reality we don't get to live in introduce the education team where your group and your partner groups come in and help us define, track, educate all the people that need to know how to sell these products and do it with some consistency and some enterprise grade talent, which you guys have done really nicely. So I say all that to recap why we partner so well and why our partnership is so important. I couldn't agree more. I think one of the things that we do well is disrupt that way of that off the shelf, out of the box thinking. I think that your team and those partners that we have, and I want to get into those real quick, that we do so well is that I think about a project I used to do with not just elementary age students, but even with adults, we would transfer this along. This marshmallow challenge is what it was called. And you give a group about, I think it's like four or five of the big roaster marshmallows, 20 pieces of spaghetti noodles that are hard still, some tape and some string. And the task is in 20 minutes, design and build the tallest structure that you can. Do you know which group is the most successful in thousands and thousands and thousands of iterations of this project? The younger kids, I think. Kindergartners, because they do not subscribe to a way of thinking that that's how we've always done it. I've got myself in a box. This has to go here. This has to go there. They just build. And I think that the remarkable part of what you and your team do and our partners do is they do not constrain themselves to that mindset of, well, This is how it has to be. No, it's what could it be and thinking differently that way. So a lot of what we do on the L&D side is trying to disrupt that way of thinking and think more broadly in open minds. Yeah, I think that brings us to our guest list and why they were selected because it was a very purposeful, curated set of companies and then specifically people within those companies, why they were invited. We won't get through every one, but I think you and I can hit on the general personality types and skill sets uh, that this group represents, because it's a pretty interesting group, a very successful group from an outsider's point of view. But from the inside, partnering with this group of folks has been wonderful because they bring that humble, persistent, curious personality type, the kindergartner. They'll appreciate that association. Uh, Yeah, you guys are (laughs) kindergartners. Yeah. (laughs) What they do better than kindergartners is probably wash their hands. So there's that. Yeah, fair. (laughs) I can't speak for everyone, but there's a few on there. Well, who did we have? Rattle through it. I mean, we've got some killer guests with some pretty good guests here. So rattle through it. Who do we have? Your memory is going to be better than mine. So let me get mine out first. Starting with the last one, Casey Hamlin. Head of measurement at TikTok. Brilliant guy. Lots of rolled up sleeves experience pushing through retail media for many years at other companies. JSD, another recent one. I'm picking all the easy ones. John Diaz, Superset, and a whole host of stuff before that. Sean Mueller from iSpot. Brilliant guy. I've been following iSpot and Sean for many, many years as they reinvent the CTV and TV measurement space. Xander, get his last name, please, so I don't embarrass myself. Casodas. There we go, from Freewheel. Brilliant collaborator. Love working with him. Sherry Smith, now Critio. 
at the time. It was a different company, Oz, from Clinch. And then I'm going to round up with Google and throw it your way. But Sean and Andrea, Sean McGee and Andrew Naylor, as they're standing up some retail media specific support models at Google, came in and talked about that, which was fascinating. Google, just a little startup, speaking of a garage, a little startup in Silicon Valley, just a small company. It's funny you say that, but when it comes to retail media and you wouldn't have thought of Google as a kindergartner or a humble collaborator five years ago. But in this retail media space, they've admitted like, hey, we aren't going to write software that's one size fits all for everybody here. We would like to. We have the engineering capacity to do so. But y'all are so different. Walmart, Target, Kroger, Albertsons, Amazon, everyone's so unique and strange. We're going to lean in and build custom partnerships with you instead and figure out how our tool set uniquely integrates. It's a little more work, but a humble partner does that. And Google probably more than anyone on this list, has shifted that mindset, at least in this group that we're working with. I couldn't agree more, I think. And Daniela Rittmeyer from Capgemini, boy, that one knocked my socks off. She's about as brilliant as they get and and tiptoeing into the world of AI. I mean, you know. My brain still hurts. Yeah, that's about as cutting edge as you get. Harry Kargman came in. He's a really, really smart guy, innovative groundbreaker there. How do we forget this one, man? The CPG guys bringing... That crossover event you didn't know you needed in your life, having the CPG guys in. Talk about folks who have been there, seen that, done that, all the different iterations of retail media and being able to look in their crystal ball and forecast what they think is coming. That was a great episode. Terry Sweeney, she's brilliant. And we partner with her a lot, bringing some of those great ideas to life and thinking about how do we disrupt our shoppers' path to purchase within. One of the best, yeah. Pinterest in general, but then Carrie and her crew Couldn't be more collaborative. We had Courtney Crossley coming in from our partnership at the Mars Agency. She's awesome. And then, of course, we brought in, how could we talk about retail without bringing in some CPGs? Ann Martin and Steve McGowan from our great partners at Mondelez. I've worked with Ann for, I'm not going to tell you how many years, but Ann taught me a lot about shopper marketing and is always one to lean in and think about, Let's test something. Let's do something crazy and see if we can't move some more units and drive that velocity. No, they get mad if we don't bring them the new innovative stuff. They're like, you have a standing order to bring us anything new and innovative that you want to pilot with us. We will figure it out, which is just the best. Which is exactly what you want, right? Otherwise, you know, let's just stack cans and use hope as a strategy that someone's going to buy it. No, let's disrupt a little bit and see if we can't get them to think differently. And speaking of think differently, our very first episode all the way back, Ben Sullivan coming in and talking to us and really setting the stage for what this podcast was going to eventually evolve into. Yeah, Ben was a great guest. He was actually the first trade desk and Ben were the first folks in my physical garage when I moved from Roundel to the collective just about three years ago. And so that was a fun kickoff. Let's talk about your past a little bit. You put me in the spotlight. Let's talk about your time. Our folks, our listeners have heard us talk about you had some time at Roundel and yeah, we're not going to shy away from it. How did that go? How'd that look? Talk a little bit about what you were doing even before Target and Roundell, if you were. Let's dive in. I know you said Saskatchewan, rural, but what led little Evan out of the woods and into the big city? Oh, this is a good one. It's a growing up, super small town. Didn't have a lot of exposure to the different career paths that were out there. It's a very ranching, farming focused province, at least that part of it is, and some oil exploration. There's a few different core jobs that really didn't appeal to me. And so I really wanted to just see what else was out there, what types of careers, what kinds of people. So I didn't go to college after high school. I took a year off, worked on some farms, did some harvesting, drove truck, and really saved up some cash for the second year post high school where I moved to the Philippines. And I lived there for seven months, ended up meeting a lot of great people, did some touring up and down the beautiful white sands of Boracay. And Batungas, I think, was another province that we were in and spent a lot of time in Manila. And the place I was staying at was right across the street from a computer college. I barely touched a computer. I won't give you my age, but we were definitely still using the dial-in modems when I was in high school. So saw these kids going to the college. I'm like, man, that looks fun. They look like they're having a good time. Went over there. It would happen to be a computer science school. I signed up for a six-week intro class which was BASIC and Pascal, which are just training languages. Fell in love with it, realized what I wanted to do when I grew up, so I moved back home, took a Bachelor of Science degree in Calgary, Alberta. Shout out to my Alberta friends. And soon after that, degree was wrapping up. 
I just put my resume out to anyone that would take it. I traveled to a couple job fairs. One happened to be in Phoenix, Arizona. And the coolest response I got was from a startup called Innovonics. They did a hardware encrypted online transactions. This was pre PayPal. And this ex Honeywell engineer invented a really cool way to do that. And so I went down, I think I was employee nine and worked for him for about six months until the dot com bubble burst. And so all of our funding dried up and a very sad story. And I had to switch careers pretty quickly. So I moved over to Telco. They were hiring. Quest Communications, now CenturyLink, was looking for an audience builder. So SQL skills, think relational databases, building marketing segments for their channels. Did that for five or six years, really cut my teeth on what it means to collect clean, hygienic data, put it into structures that make sense for your business purpose, and then build tools on top of it to extract that value. So I got really good at segmentation, audience building, data automation, relational data management. And then met Target at a conference in Boston for a a little tool called Unica, uh, since been bought by IBM, but it was an audience building tool for marketing teams. Really fell in love with Target's vision and mission. This was pre-Roundell, probably 18 years ago now. And so I applied for a position on that team that was getting into that software. This was an enterprise marketing team. So really no retail media concepts yet, but built out tons of different software solutions, for Target. At the same time, I went back and got my MBA and moved over to the marketing side where I managed some of their marketing channels, paid search, and continued to build products while managing some of those channels. Yeah, really fell in love with that. Learned so much at Target on the enterprise marketing side. Built out an ID graph in-house. This was pre-live ramp. So we had really had a lot of success with Hash Team. And as Roundell started to get Steam, and Christy came in to run that, Uh, my team was moved over entirely to support the retail media arm, which happened to be very similar types of concepts, right? You're just doing it for a CPG instead of the enterprise. So some tweaking was required. Did that for a number of years, seven years, I think, in total, supporting Roundell as a product lead of their innovation track. And then when Christy moved to take over the collective here at Albertsons, my first phone call was to her, and we figured out a way to work together again. And I, I quickly moved over to support the innovation product track here. And we are grateful for every minute that you are here. Thank you, sir. There's a couple things coming out of what you just said there. It's a remarkable journey. Uh, Three things. Let me see if I can remember if I can count to three. The first one, your time in the Philippines. True or false, lumpia is the greatest food ever developed by humankind. Oh my goodness. Pancit, Canton, lumpia. Yeah, there's so many good places to eat and street vendors everywhere. For me as a snacker, probably the champion snacker, my greatest skill set. What a great city. I mean, the food, the people, the experience was, yeah, it was a game changer for me from understanding diversity and different people's struggles and just how different ways of life can happen. So coming out of small town Saskatchewan into that environment opened my eyes quite a bit. There you go. Second thing that you tell you, a lot of your life has been spent in pre this or pre that, I noticed. So pre live ramp, free trade desk, pre, pre, pre. So you are prehistoric is what I would call that. There's my dad joke for the episode. (laughs) I'll take it. Yeah. Lastly, I would say there's a phrase you brought up that leads me to kind of what I want to talk about as we think about wrapping our episode here a little bit. But you talked about data hygienics and I joked about that, but then in a previous episode, but found out very quickly from the very smart people in the room. No, that's actually a term that we use. It's not something that we just made up on this podcast. So that being one of the themes this great list of people that we've rattled through. We've got some recurring themes from previous episodes that have popped up that I'd really like us to touch on a little bit as we think about upcoming episodes. But some of those themes, if you've got the list, what do you think some of those themes are that have popped up? Well, the theme that they live in is really collaboration and education. So I think it's so apropos that you're co-hosting this podcast because without education, there's really nothing new to collaborate on And then if you do happen to have a lightning in a pan moment where one person in one room invented this new great thing, what are you going to do with it? Like you got to get into the hands of the practitioners and the operators and the marketers. Like people have to be not just technically understanding this great new tool that you built, Dan, but they got to be motivated emotionally too. So why am I learning this thing? What is this thing going to do for me or my client? How much does it cost? Like there's some mechanics in there too. And so all of that which we might want to call just like the recipe for an education soup 
is the main thing that I see through all the people and the topics. And then the outcome is once it's built or once it's invented, we've got to get it into the hands of the masses, which is where your skill set is so powerful. Education soup. <laughs> Don't quote me on that one. No, it's recorded for the record. I'm not quoting you. The podcast is, but I'm going to take that. I'm going to use that. I call that a little bit that everything that you just rattled off there. And I appreciate the nod to education. I think all of that is our innovation mindset uh, with the guests that we've had. And, and one of those themes that we see repeatedly pop up that what does it take for a product team to be successful? Getting it into the practitioners, refining the process because it's not going to be perfect for everybody. That mindset is one that, that has popped up a lot. Yep. And my second one, Dan, is also mindset related, which is trust. There's got to be not just legal mandated trust where contracts can kind of shape safe places for two companies to collaborate. You can tell listening to these podcasts, there's a great friendship surrounding some of our conversations with these people. And there's a lot of trust, of course, but just transparency and understanding that, hey, we're going to expose some things that may not look great. You want to go to version two? Well, we can't get off version one because of XYZ. It's going to take six months. Those are things you might not say to a customer when you're trying to sell something. But if you want to evolve together and invent the next generation, you have to put that on the table. And so that means there has to be an environment of safetyness. People need to feel secure in sharing some of those things, sharing that they don't know a core detail of the software that they're representing. And that's the environment, starting with Christy, but really then propagating through the rest of our leadership team, that ability to partner in a safe, collaborative way with all of these people is the foundation to get to the cool stuff, the actual products that we invent. So that's theme number two for me. I would say tagging on with that, the core idea that relationships are the pivot point that not just the retail industry moves around, but the retail media industry moves around. And, and I couldn't agree with you more. There are this group of people that we've had on here and are going to continue to invite to this podcast. It really is core. It's ten. It's uh, tantamount to what we're building here. And that is that if we don't have that trust or a secure relationship, we can't call out when things are going wrong. And then we're just doing a bunch of bad things together at that point. It's almost like there's any behavior powered by pay grade. It's almost always counterintuitive to innovation because it has to be a trusted environment, a humble place, a place to ask dumb questions. And I think traditional org structures and companies who are maybe pay grade motivated, the highest paid opinion in the room gets to decide, you give up that youthful innovation track, the ones building the spaghetti and marshmallow towers. Those ideas don't surface to the top. And then you're stuck with less than the best, which is just not going to cut it for our shareholders, for our customers. But more importantly, for ourselves, like I want to build cool next-gen products. I don't get excited about installing off-the-shelf software. I don't think anybody really does. But we want to solve the next-gen problems for our clients. So you just look where the friction is, look for the logical path forward on how to solve that friction, and then build products that are in that bucket. And they're usually one or two steps ahead of of the competition, which feels good. Feels good when you start seeing other RMNs picking up the products that we launch six months later. Yeah, it's fun to be first. <laughs> it takes courage, though, courage and leadership. And that's an attribute that I see as one of the themes here, the folks that have been teased out on this podcast as well, is there takes an element of courage, be brave, take a risk. That's something that the old coaching tree I mentioned that I come from, dad had always coached that. Take a risk because you know what happens if you don't? Nothing. And then we're stuck right where we're always at. I love all the anecdotes and insights and background that you bring, not just in the education world, Dan, but then all that store stuff. And I think it's so critical to bring the next generation of retail media products to life. We won't be able to get into it on this episode, but its goal was well beyond ads on site and into the mechanics of the merchandise world, where you get into a whole nother realm of budgets, constraints, and opportunities. But I think that's where the biggest unlock for new innovation comes from is how do we bring the power of our stores? Because there's a lot of those smart people that haven't been tapped yet in retail media. You're one of them. How do we bring that knowledge and the day-to-day -day lives of people shopping in our stores, which is about 94% of our sales still? How do we tap that and bring that to light in a mindful, respectful way for retail media to evolve? I think that's our 2025 goals. I like that as a goal. I think that maybe the simple answer, there's no simple answer, but if I had to give a simple answer, it's one that we already touched on. Just ask, just ask them, build the relationship, build the trust and ask their opinion. You're going to be remarkably and pleasantly surprised at what they have to say. I think it's a remarkable time that we live in on that front. 
But in thinking about the future casting, it wouldn't be a garage podcast if I didn't ask the question, how do we sustain this retail media growth? What do we do to keep this ball rolling? Oh, I think, Dan, the secret to that it lives in your brain and your dad's brain and the brain of all the merchants and store managers and leaders that we have here. Right now, if we think of U.S. retail media, the biggest names really focus on the digital experience. And that's because it's easy, right? Even within our company, we can build an ad unit, build some paid search on our site and deploy it across all 12, 14 banners. When you get into the in-store side where the most of our customer interactions are happening, most of the sales are happening, that physical relationship of looking at a product, looking at a brand, getting inspired by a recipe happening in that aisle, in the local environment where people are shopping and living their day-to-day lives, that represents a vast untapped potential for us to, again, appropriately incentivize and inspire our shoppers in ways that make our brands and Albertsons mutually successful. And retail media, when we move into that, should start to feel more like a seamless enabler, not a media campaign, not just a marketing pitch. It should feel fully integrated, online to offline, completely focused on that customer shopping journey and the inspirational components that an in-store experience can bring to that. Now we can talk about the whole power of the store relationship, not just this media accelerator arm, which is important and powerful, But I think the bigger conversation lives when the store and the digital live together. That'll be when customers are best served. And for me, customers include the shopper and the CPG brands that invest with us. I think it's a great way to put it and a great way to wrap. It's been a fun episode this time, talking to you a little bit about history, where we've been, where we come from, what we do here and how we've built this garage out. I want to thank you for allowing me to come along this journey with you. I know that the garage is really your brainchild, but allowing me to come and sit with you and learn about All these great things has been just one of the great honors of my life. So thank you for bringing me along for this. And I will tell everybody who listens, farmers are the smartest people on the planet. So don't ever look sideways at it because necessity is the mother of all invention. You heard Evan say that, and there's nobody better at solving a problem than a farmer who needs something fixed. Well, Dan, you're too kind. And the kindness continues into this episode. I'll go one up and say teachers are the most underappreciated and necessary pieces of our puzzle and growing humanity, understanding how to be more empathetic in our day-to-day lives. And I mean teachers in the broadest sense, not in a school setting, but anyone who's willing to educate, be open-minded, understand that people have different learning patterns. That's how we get through a lot of our issues as the Retail Media Network, but even beyond that. So I appreciate everything you've done to educate me and educate our listeners. Happy to do it. Love teaching. It's a passion. It's fun. For everybody else tuning in, this has been a very fun episode of The Garage. Thank you so much. If you like what you hear, tune in for upcoming episodes. We've got a lot more slated with great guests, great partners, great mindsets, forward-thinking people. We're going to bring them into the garage and really start building some great stuff together. So thank you for tuning in. Like it as always. Subscribe where you can find it. And thank you so much. This has been a special episode of The Garage.